what I love about this moment, and I think so many people who made sacrifices so we can have this clarion call or this reckoning is that we get to be honest about what's happening in the world and in our country, maybe for the first time in a long time, without the typical consequence. We'll get to make more films. Mm-hmm. We can charge this country and say it's racist from the top to the bottom and not get ostracized like so many Black artists did before us, from Paul Robinson to Eartha Kitt. You know what I'm saying? Like, we have a freedom now. And so I always want to honor those Black artists who came before us, who, who had to pay for being honest. What do I got to do? Write a slave musical, an all-white play? This is some bullshit. It rang a little inauthentic. I asked myself, did a black person really write this? My name is Angelique Jackson, film and media reporter at Variety, and joining me for this Black Women of Award Season conversation are Rada Blank, writer, director, and star of The 40-Year-Old Version, and Channing Godfrey Peoples, writer and director of Miss Juneteenth. Both of your films are so much about these Black women trying to have ownership of their own lives. And in the same way, you both took ownership of your own art as writers and directors and filmmakers. How did what we saw on screen relate to the behind the scenes as a filmmaker, uh, figuring out how to get these movies made? I knew that um, I was telling the story with a Black woman lead, you know, and I was telling it about about a community people were unfamiliar with a day. Juneteenth that really people didn't know what it was, to be honest. So (laughs) when I would go in with my producer, you know, my husband is actually a producer on the film and is my creative partner. And what we would do when it was time for pitches, we would literally say, so let's split this up. You explain what Juneteenth is. And once we've established that, then I'll go in and I'll tell, you know, the person, whoever we're pitching to, the characters are. Welcome to the Miss Juneteenth pageant. I will never get over seeing Miss Juneteenth cleaning toilets. <laughs> you know, people weren't um, jumping up and down to produce a film like this, you know, about a little known day. And it's interesting because we released in 2020, um, which feels like uh, 20 years ago now. Wow. And um, obviously there were, as Black people, again, you know, we were going through this idea, can we... Um, be in our homes and survive or walk down the street and survive. And, mm. all these, you know, and um, George Floyd happened right around the time, you know, in which our film was released. And, you know, people knew what Juneteenth was now. In, in one respect, I appreciated that people finally understood what it was, but I think that there's a whole education in which we have to do around it for people to really, really get what it is. You know, when I think about when people say, Art imitating life, imitating art, imitating life. It's like I'm in a loop that will not end because there were moments where I was trying to explain the film to a potential financier and their responses were probably not as comical as the characters in the film. But, um, you know, one thing that I heard a lot as a playwright that I had written into the film Um, but I ended up taking it out. I had this sequence at the beginning of the film where before she ends up with the black artistic director, you see her having a montage of meetings with different white artistic directors or literary agents. And they all go, oh my God, Harlem Ave is amazing. Amazing. What else you got? Oh my God, Harlem Ave. I could not stop thinking about this play all day. What else you got? And so that what else you got is something that I experienced a lot as a playwright. And then as I was making the film, and I think the messaging there was, we love this. This is, you're talented. That's not a question. Can you please write something I can either easily finance, meaning maybe you not be in it, maybe don't make it black and white, maybe shoot on a digital fat format, maybe put a star in it, Or could you just make it so that white people can relate to it a little bit better? So that's what that, this is great, what else you got? So I experienced a lot of that 
I'm not in that place now, but trust me, so much of what I really experienced as a creative is I reflected it in the, in the film. I think that's what I do with my frustration around not being seen, not being valued. And the funny shit is a lot of those people who were like, mm, change the title, mm, maybe Tiffany Haddish, mm, okay. they're calling now. Oh, they're calling. Not Judd sure. Apatow didn't have a problem with the title. He got it. Ah. <laughs> he sure didn't. He was actually like a good sport. I thought he and I were going to have our like, what's good, Miley moment. Um, and we we were supposed to be on a panel together and it didn't work out, but we had a brief exchange where he just he said really kind things. And for me, it wasn't like, oh my God, I want it so bad for him to like the movie. To me, it was a full circle moment. For the people who said, don't name it that, that's going to be a curse. He completely got my joke and he got that I was appropriating white culture in the way people have been appropriating black culture for hundreds of years. So he got it. Being authentically you and writing in the space of, of blackness is not really going against the grain. It's celebrating what already is. But in this business, when someone like Channing it takes seven years to get financing, he takes about six years to get financing. It does feel like going against the grain because mm -hmm. clearly there's something that sells quicker to that mainstream gatekeeper or green lighter than they think ours do. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie to you. It is vindicating as fuck that this story that so many people were like, mm -hmm, I don't know, is having its moment mm -hmm. because it means those people who said no to it were wrong. Even using Empire as an example, I know that when that show was first getting picked up, there was this question of like, oh, the international audience, you know, how, you know how black stories do internationally. Well, now that's a lie. Early thoughts about Miss Juneteenth where, you know, people brought up like pacing and stuff like that. You know, I was keenly aware, you know, of why I paced the film the way that I paced it. And, you know, there, oftentimes you don't hear those kind of questions a lot when white filmmakers do that kind of pacing. You know, I paced the film. There's a um, timelessness in this particular community, this Black community in the South. And I wanted you to feel like folks felt, you know, yes. it's just the same thing. Like people work during the week and live for the weekend. You know, I wanted you to feel that. It's delicious and it's beautiful and it's human, but it, it becomes radical in yeah. space yeah. where Black filmmakers are asked to curtail, mm -hmm. to truncate, to shorten, speed up. It's like, no, yeah. I'm going to take this breath in and let it go. Yes. Um, it's okay yeah. to have this beautiful view of Black life happening. It's okay for sensitivity and nuance. I'm with you 100%. I'm with Let's do it. Let's continue to do it. And I think that these studios, like there maybe needs to be a little more introspection about how they approach Black storytelling. We need more of us in that gatekeeping position. Um, but we also need more of us working side by side with the Rodgers and the Channings of the world to be our advocates. I don't know if I'd be able to make the movie I wanted to make if it wasn't for Lena Waithe being my producer. Because in telling the story, black and white, first time director, first time actor in a you know, major role, whatever, writing, producing, whatever, none of those things were risks for Lena. She was the only person who did not ask me to compromise one thing from my appearance to how I speak, to what I cast. I mean, I got to make the movie I wanted to make because another Black woman was like, yeah, what's the, what's the problem? I'm not cute. <laughs> or built to suit a fashion model size. <laughs> that's my baby. Phenomenal woman, that's me. For people who don't know, part of the reason why y'all know each other does have to do with Sundance, how both of your films did go through the Sundance Institute process uh, tell me a little bit about how you first met. I just remember seeing a description of your film and just saying to myself, boy, do we need this story in the lexicon, in the landscape of storytelling, because it's not one 
I've ever seen. Not about this world and not through this particular character and her ambitions and her impulses and her regrets. I mean, it's just, again, like I think, I'm sure 40 year version speaks to this. It's like a Black woman who's centered, who's on a journey that's very complex. It's not every day that we see that. We are seeing more and more of it. But it was something I was immediately invested in and interested in because, you know, you you can't help but also look for things that are affirming what it is that you want to do and say in the world. What do you remember about first becoming aware of the 40-year-old version and Rada? There's just such a complexity in the film. And for me as a Black woman, it's completely invigorating and inspirational. Mm. And, you know, there's a specificity in the film. And I love the way that um, Rada poured herself. You could feel her in every single moment of this film, in every single frame. And, And I understand you're in front of your film, Rada, but I mean, you can feel the spirit of the film. Hey, come on, what you need? <clears throat> Beats? Tracks? For what? For me? You know, to have something so personal, I, I just, and, and I've made a very personal film, too, so I understand it in that way. But I just loved it. And, you know, Rada's touched on that we have made films about the humanity of Black women. Black women is these, like, living, breathing beings with lives. Complex, yes. Love interests and, you know, and goals and wants and dreams, you know, and um, one of the- And regrets too. And regrets. And regrets. Because I think Black women characters often what the trope is, is that like, we just power through. No matter what's happening, we just gonna make it. And we sit back, sometimes we sit down, we go, damn, like- what what if and 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 how did this happen? I mean, just that contemplative black woman character who is questioning things. Like, did I do this right? This life thing right? We usually see black women show up fully put together. Why? Because in a lot of stories, black women serve another character. They're not the person going on the journey. They're the all-knowing woman with the hand on hip who's going to tell you something. They're not the person with the hands up like this, like, what have I done? Or who am I? And mm-hmm. I think both of these films are in that space of who am I? What's in front of me? Totally agree with you. Like, I was thinking about this earlier when I was thinking about both of our films. And it is a rarity to make a film in which a Black woman is up front. And especially a black woman, a black woman who's on a journey. And you, you know, one of the things that I love that you just mentioned is, you know, a, a black woman gets to have thoughts and you know, <laughs> you know, gets to have a moment where she can breathe, you know. Like, and mm-hmm. that's always what I sought to do was I wanted to tell stories not only about black women, but all, also about the interior lives of black women. As a director, I love for people to be able to sit in quiet moments. And also, you know, I probably really, really frustrated the sound too because I was like, this is the kind of movie where we're going to be having conversations. People aren't going to be projecting. I want them to feel as authentic as possible. So, <laughs> You know, one of the films that I am often, um, then I feel like now our films are kind of in this canon is um, Losing Ground by Kathleen Collins. This is her first feature film for Foray. And this is one of the first films where a Black woman was centered. I think the only other film around that time was maybe Cheryl Dunye's Watermelon Woman. But to see this woman who was a philosophy professor, who was married to this very kind of out there painter, and she is questioning like who she is and what she wants. Is she happy? That's not something you see Black women doing a lot of in celluloid. A lot of times our characters are put upon or there's a struggle um, and there's some guy to rescue her. It's not that internal conflict that you're talking about, Channing. And I feel like um, Losing Ground, um, Watermelon Woman, you know, these are those rare films from 30 years ago where that was happening and they were rare and and hopefully going forward you know your daughter and other girls will have like 10 15 maybe 20 films about that kind of journey i I remember being totally like absorbed in julie dash's daughters of the dust daughters of the dust yes because of that reason 
you know, you see these black women, you know, having specificity and complexity, you know, having like complex lives and um, you get to see them dreaming and you get to see them in all of mm. you and the visuals for that film are just, Oof. you know, next level. <laughs> breathtaking, breathtaking. You know, Thank you for reminding me of that film. That film was set on the sea islands. And right. I remember also as a you know black woman from the South, that was the first time that I'd really seen black women portrayed in that way from the South, mm. you know, with that particular perspective, there were other films that I'd seen black women portrayed from the South, like the, you know, the color purple and things like that. But um, it just really inspired me in a way I can't even explain right now, but it's in my library mm. as well for my daughter. <laughs> okay. Such a beautiful film and such an awesome filmmaker. Like, can you imagine what it, it was like to be a black woman in that year and that time and want to tell that story where it's all black people, there's not another race of people represented. And yet you feel the weight of, you know, kind of the psychological chains of, you know, the enslavement of our people through their different struggles, how it manifests. And yet at times there were just stories between, you know, a, a husband and a wife dealing with the baby coming and the amount of resistance that I got in making this film in 2019, I can only imagine what Julie had to face 30 years ago. This isn't a comedy. It is a period piece, but it's not playing into the slave tropes. And um, what a, what a pioneer she was. Um, and what a, what a great example she was for us. It's like, Total agreement. Thank mm -hmm. you, Julie Dash. <laughs> I remember one time I was doing an RFP for a network. I will not name it, but it was about a young Black girl who wanted to become a stand-up comic. And I had made it past this stage and this stage and this stage. And then one day the, the, the producers at the network called me in and they said, we love this and we're so close to going to pilot. Does she have to be Black? And they said that to me, there was no nervousness. There was no, does she have to be black? Can she be mixed race or can she be, and this was maybe 10, 15 years ago. So what I love about this moment, and I think so many people who made sacrifices so we can have this clarion call or this reckoning is that we get to be honest about what's happening in the world and in our country, maybe for the first time in a long time, without the typical consequence, we'll get to make more films. Mm -hmm. We can charge this country and say it's racist from the top to the bottom and not get ostracized like so many Black artists did before us, from Paul Robinson to Eartha Kitt. You know what I'm saying? Like, we have a freedom now. And so I always want to honor those Black artists who came before us, who who had to pay for being honest. You know what I mean? Like authentic Black culture, unapologetic Black culture. There's so much Rada that, that you put on the line in the 40-year-old version, just letting like, you know, like intimate scenes where you're just in the room and alone and you let us in. I'm so grateful for it. And I know what that is, you know, what you have to put on the line to let people in in that way, you know, it's such a vulnerable place. And I'm thankful for it because it just makes your film so much more personal, you know? And as far as like those quiet moments, that's where the radical filmmaking comes in. It seems like such a simple moment before a Black filmmaker, when we're often encouraged to accelerate and, you know, cut this down and cut that out that becomes the soul of your storytelling. And, uh, you know, I always joke that I, I not only appropriated Judd Apatow's title, but I appropriated his running time because Black people were always told to make a 90 minute movie. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not making a 90 minute movie, but the, the contemplated moments in my film were so deliberate. You know, this year audiences got so many films from Black women filmmakers but the film from Gina Prince Bythewood or Don Porter and Garrett Bradley is so different from the films that you two made. Whose work inspired you this year? For me, it's been absolutely inspiring, especially to see um, Black women, you know, telling our stories. I, there's another uh, film that just 
stunned me was Gary Bradley's time, you know, um, it's just such a stunning film. And I was heartened by it to see them all like come out at this particular time and, you know, find audiences too, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle you know, of a time when Black people are again fighting for our lives. You know, when are we not fighting for our lives? But, you know, yeah. it, um, you know, in this pronounced way, and, you know, when everything just kind of exploded, you know, in this country. But I think what we don't see is all the time in which people have fought to tell these stories. And both mm. Rod and I have touched on it a bit. But, you know, it's not just we throw out numbers, arbitrary numbers. It took us six years, it took us seven years, but it really has taken us our whole lives, you know, mm. in order to create these kind of stories and especially these like incredibly like personal stories. And so it's just so important for us to, you know, not only have black storytellers or black stories being made is to see black stories being made from so many different perspectives in which they're being made now. And there's so much more, um, there's a, there's so much more hill to climb. Like it should not take this long for these films to be made. Like the the storytellers should be continuing telling stories all the time. You know, it shouldn't be such a large hill to climb to say we matter. Right. I love that more and more um, creators of creators of color are creating worlds and not worrying about who gets it. And not worrying about, let me translate this for that particular audience. That's actually going to pull more people in because the creator is saying, I'm not apologizing for this world I'm making. You know, whether it's The Sopranos or, you know, The Wire, like, this is the world as I see it. This feels like an authentic, and if you're with it, you're with it. And if you're not, you know, I always talk about that there was a review of Lover's Rock, which was one of my favorite films this year, where the person reviewing it said, yeah, this is great. The songs are wonderful, but nothing really happens. And it's like, we need people who know that something did happen there, Mm -hmm. translating and articulating it. I'm not saying you have to love our work simply because we have the same culture, but recognizing the culture and the value there, we need more and more Angeliques in the world to kind of help, you know, be the doorknob into the house of the film that we, the story that we're telling. I loved Farewell Amore. Mm-hmm. Echo's film, she's just stunning. Mm-hmm. I love Sylvie's Love that just came out. Mm-hmm. Look, I, I feel like now I'm about to name everybody Black because there were just so many good <laughs> does it kind of say to you about the about where we are in the industry at this moment to date a black woman has not been nominated for best director so what would it mean for that woman to be you but also what does a recognition like that actually signify when it comes to the industry and opportunities moving forward i absolutely think that we are deserving i think um Rada, Rada Blank is deserving. I think Channing Godfrey Peoples is deserving. I think all these Black women that have been passed over for that that particular kind of award have been deserving. Um, none of us are here by accident. Nobody lucky. There is, if you actually go into our background, you will see all the work that we've put in in order to be here. And, you know, everyone has different stories. Um, and, and we, you know, at the end of the day, we have, um, we've approached these films as a sense of, you know, love and passion, but also craftsmanship and determina- mm-hmm. determination mm-hmm. and drive. And yes, we're absolutely, absolutely deserve to be considered. You know, I'm, I'm sometimes at odds around, you know, what the awards are and who are giving them and to whom. Um, because there's one part of my brain that knows if, myself or Channing or any other Black woman is nominated at that level, let's just say it, the Oscars, right? How that would, one, create an opportunity to make a next film. Like, that's just practical. Like, it means you've been given this validation, this stamp of approval. And if we could do it, then surely there's someone right there behind us who also has the ability to get that kind of acknowledgement, celebration, and opportunity to continue their work. Then there's the other part of me that says, I mean, at one point there was a hashtag. 
Oscar So White. And it wasn't like, even though the hashtag was new, it wasn't a new belief. I mean, our films have historically been overlooked Mm -hmm. for decades. Mm -hmm. And so I'm torn because there are parts of me that's like, I know that this this is the dream of many uh, filmmakers to be considered, you know? Um, But then sometimes I say, but considered by who? This particular platform has often overlooked our storytelling. So I try not to put too much. I am going to lie. If Poverty Point gets nominated, I would get thrilled because that's like the culture on display in a whole other way. But I'm not expecting any of it because I know so many great films by amazing Black filmmakers that never got any kind of acknowledgement. So I don't know why they would choose me this year or Channing or any other Black filmmaker this particular year. Um, I do know that there are more diverse people voting on these things, so that might impact it. But for me, it's an opportunity, should something like that happen, to, you know, be a symbol for the young person who needs it, you know, because they may see that as a particular pinnacle of success. But I also value other forms of success. Again, I got a lovely reception from Julie Dash and Charles Burnett and my people. So Mm -hmm. I already won. 